I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people, but I have been moving about. I have been with you wherever you went. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, if you see the title of this here uh, day, God's Groove, People on the Move, you might think that we were talking about something, I don't know, lively and joyful and happy, looks a little gay discotheque going on there, yeah? Um, <laughs> And I do not want to make light of the fact that the subject matter we're talking about for the next six weeks is a life and death reality that includes horrendous suffering that we would not wish upon anyone. And I also want us to be observant of the fact that throughout the biblical narrative, we read of a God who has a style of interaction. And it's called call and response. Now, I'm mindful that uh, we here in mainline churches that have historically been populated by people of European descent that call and response may not be our groove, just a guess, um, but it is God's. And I'm going to prove that to you by um, teaching about the entire biblical context of migration in about 10 minutes. What do you think? All right. See, now... I got all challenged this week because I hung out with my friend Jamie, and she told me that someone said, oh, First Congregational Church is one of those churches where you can go and believe whatever you want to believe. Now, I got challenged by that, and I have a bit of an ego, so I felt like I needed to prove to y'all that actually you can believe what you want to believe around here because we believe you to have brains, And we believe that the Holy Spirit speaks to you and that you actually don't need me to tell you what to believe because God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are in direct relationship to you. Yes. And that these scriptures right here can speak to you just as good as they can speak to me. Amen? All right. So you can believe what you want to believe and we're all good. Um, you start acting like a jerk, we're going to have an issue. That's a different thing. <laughs> So, if you want to pull your Bibles out and follow along with me, you can do that, but I guarantee I'm going to go too fast for you to be flipping and staying uh, with me the whole time. So, i got a lot of ground to cover here, y'all. This is serious. 2,000 years? Huh? It'll be on YouTube, so you can fact-check me from home, all right? All right. So... The biblical context of migration. And when I say biblical context, I'm talking about from the beginnings of the Israelites, the Hebrews writing up until the time when the Jews and the Christians split from each other. We cannot talk about separate entities, Jews and Christians, before the first century of the Common Era, right? Those things were not separate until then. So we're going to be talking about from the patriarchs to when the Jews and the Christians split. All right? Everybody ready? All right. Adam and Eve, they inherited land, and then they were forced out. That's called? Exile. Mm -hmm. Noah. Noah lived in the time of a flood. Weather patterns forced him to relocate, so he was seeking asylum. 
Abraham and his descendants were specifically called out, this is in Genesis, you can find it, to move out and multiply to expand their territories. They claimed lands, they set up altars, that's known as colonization. All right? Joseph, descendant of the patriarch, goes to Egypt because his brothers, who? His brothers. Who? His brothers, his biological brothers, sold him into slavery. That's called slavery, right. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So so Joseph is in slavery, and then his brothers who sold him into slavery in the first place experience a severe drought in their own land, which causes hunger, which drives them to seek asylum. And guess who they go to to ask for food? Hmm, what goes around comes around. The Hebrews are living in Egypt as a result of the migration of Joseph and his brothers. There's a regime change. Pharaoh comes into power, takes the Hebrews into captivity, and they become slaves. Right. Moses becomes a refugee when his mother puts him in the river. You remember this from last week, yes? Yes. Seeking asylum, his mother seeks asylum for him by putting him in the river. He's taken in by power, which means he becomes privileged through adoption, yes? All right. He experiences a crisis when he watches somebody of his own ethnic group being enslaved. He commits murder. And then he flees. And he seeks asylum in the wilderness from Jethro, who becomes his father-in-law comes back because he's called by God. That's a commissioning. That's a divine commissioning. And he liberates people, his own people. One might call that missionary work. You could. Then the Hebrews move out of Pharaoh's land and they go into the wilderness. This is in Exodus and Deuteronomy. And there They wander about. That's a kind of movement, wandering, yeah. And then when they get to the promised land, they conquer and they colonize the Canaanites. This is Joshua and Judges. In order to get to Canaan, God parts the Red Sea and they are liberated, yes? So look how just in one generation we go from liberated people to conquerors and colonists. Yep. Okay. Next, in the promised land, there's a bunch of tribes. Sometimes they get along and sometimes they don't. And when they're not getting along, they travel and they kill each other. There's movement in that, yeah? Then they turn into a a confederation, which is kind of like a country. And during that time, they're fighting with internal and external enemies. And a lot of that has to do with what empire is in power at any given moment, yeah? You still with me? Tell me you're with me. You with me? All right, I know, it's kind of complicated. I'm working, I'm working. All right, so the, the confederation happens, the country happens, the nation is consolidated, and then this really big superpower by the name of Babylon comes into power, and this guy named Nebuchadnezzar becomes the king, and he's kind of um, scary. And he comes in and he destroys the temple, and he takes a bunch of people into captivity and puts a bunch of the leaders and prophets and people into... Exile, that's right. A couple generations go by, and this other man comes into power, and this time of the Persian Empire, and his name is Cyrus. And he releases the Israelites from captivity in Babylon, and they go home. So that's return. That's a kind of movement, going back home, yes? All right? There's another little section in there about the Maccabees, but it's too complicated, and I don't want to tell you about it. Next, (laughs) you can read it on your own. The books are kind of gory and terrifying. Feel free. I'm not doing it. Um, The next period of time is Roman-occupied Palestine, which is the time of who? I'm sorry? Jesus. Right. That's our guy. Jesus. (laughs) Jesus is in Palestine as it's being occupied by Rome. Never does he stay in one place. 
This is our Christ we're talking about. This is not a man who stays in one place. He's a refugee as a child. His family takes him to Egypt. Then he's in Nazareth as a kid. Then he's baptized in the River Jordan. He begins his ministry in Capernaum. Then he does ministries in Judea and Samaria. He preaches all throughout the region of Galilee. And then he's in these cities that have some prominence in the Roman Empire in his second year, which is what got him in trouble. And then towards the end of his life, he goes to Jerusalem, which is the center of power. Never did he stay in one place. Early disciples, after the death of Jesus, experienced... Thank you, Aaron. I'm glad you're paying attention. (laughs) The early disciples are experiencing the colonization of their land under Rome, and it's about the same time that the second Jewish temple is destroyed, and this is when the Jewish diaspora starts to happen. And this is also when Paul starts his missionary evangelistic efforts. And so all of these Jews and all of these Christians start moving out of the Middle East into Asia, Africa, and Europe. How'd I do? That wasn't even 10 minutes, right? All right. So that's the biblical context. Um, so I hope you got the, the fact, the divine fact, the earthly fact, the human fact, the natural fact of movement. It's part of this life. It's part of this world. It's part of the seasons, right? Movement is a part of life. And now we're going to um, do something a little bit more creative, and we're going to trace some music in our tradition, Right? And I was going to ask um, Roger to come up here, but I'm just going to do it because I changed my mind. We have songs in our tradition about all of these things, and we sing them in church. And so I'd like to start with our first song and see if you can guess which one this is about. You ready? If you know it, you can sing it. Spirit, spirit of gentleness, calling and free. Spirit, spirit of restlessness, stir me from placidness, wind, wind on the sea. All right, which one is it? Invitation. Invitation, very good. Woo! Next one. We sing this one here in Koinonia. I am here, I am here, I am here with you. Where are you at? You You are are here, you are here, you are here with me. Which one? Which one is it? Taking in. Taking in. Good. All right. Next one. This is a Taize chant. It's called Stay With Me. Sing it if you know it. Stay with me, remain here with me, watch and pray, watch and pray. Which one? I heard it over here. Cojourning. Good job. Stay with me, cojourning. Remain here with me. Watch and pray. Cojourning. Good. Mm -hmm. Next one, if you were here last week, you're going to get this one real fast. I don't really. (laughs) Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. 
Children, go where I send thee. How shall I send thee? Yep. Which one is it? Huh? Yep, commissioning. Children, go where I send thee. Commissioning. God commissions the children to go. Yes, yes. And this next one you'll recognize. Peace be still and know that I am God. Peace be still and know that I am Y'all are so quick. <laughs> so it actually takes power and force to remain still, does it not? Anybody been around somebody who can't sit still and you just want to be like, I just force, force, power. There is force and power and stillness. That's a kind of movement. Next one. just sang it this morning where we sat down there we went which one is it huh nope exile, exile. yeah it's kind of slavery though. it's kind of both but there's a there's one that we'll get to in a minute all right, now this one is a more of a contemporary song. If you were at Trisha and Nathan's wedding, then you heard it. It's a great song. Go ahead. You're on your own. Go for it. Oh, man. Yeah, no, Seriously? All yeah. right. Um, <laughs> when I get older, I will be stronger. Woo! They'll call me freedom just like a waving flag. When I get older, I will be... Okay, so which one is it? When I get older, I will be stronger. They'll call me freedom, just like a waving flag. It's an anti-colonial anthem. You should check it out. All right, it's called Waving Flag. Next one you should get pretty quick. Here we go. Yeah. Let my people go. Is that the right one? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're down to the final two. Here we go. Here we go. God's going to trouble the water. Which one? No. We're going to do this last one just for fun, but you already know the answer, so. title of that song all who are thirsty all who are thirsty thirst is a kind of seeking yes we seek after what's going to be living water all who are thirsty so all of these songs all of these biblical contexts that are in our tradition have been around for thousands of years we sing this stuff every week. This is a part of our divine life. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything I want you to take from all of those scriptures and all of 
these songs, it's that people move about for very different reasons. And sometimes those reasons are great and life-giving and beautiful. And sometimes those reasons for moving are scary and terrifying. And it's about escaping violence and survival. And then there's some stuff in between too, right? Um, And so I think it's important as people of faith to hold all of that complexity in mind. So the question often rises, you know, like who is moving about in the world and where are they moving to and why? And I just want to differentiate between a couple kinds in particular. So there's like missionary movement and like vacation taking and poverty tourism that happens. And that's because some people can choose to leave their home for kicks and they can enter into other cultures, nations, and communities at whim and leave at whim and never be impacted whatsoever by the long-term ramifications of that kind of dropping in and dropping out. And then there's exile and migration and diaspora. Some people are not welcome in their home countries. They have been forced out, like the Dalai Lama, for instance or they're banished, or they're incapable of return, and they spend their entire lives wishing they could go home, missing their families, languages, cultures, and familiar territories. Those two experiences, right, like missionary stuff and diaspora exile, those are not even on the same page. Another question that I often hear in this culture, why are they here? They, in quotation marks, that's a question of the privileged, of people who were either born here or who have citizenship status or fit into the dominant culture without scrutiny by skin color or whatever. And why are they here is a totally necessary question that privileged people actually do need to ask. Not why are they here, but why? Are they here? What is the movement that prompted, what prompted the movement, right? That's an important question. Some more things that I want us to be thinking about. Who is a refugee and who is an immigrant and why? Religious wars, regime changes, weather patterns, poverty, right? All of this stuff we heard in our biblical text, we hear in our songs, they're still going on today. Those things are different. And so when people come and they're seeking amnesty or asylum or documentation or they're facing deportation or they get to stay, those things need to be discerned based on who's drawing the bordered territories, who has the power, why people have moved in the first place. Those are global questions, and I think we harm dialogue, relationships, and the possibilities to be a global community when we only think about those things from our own perspective. When we ask ourselves these questions in a country that is undoubtedly dominated by a Eurocentric culture and white supremacy, it is important to consider how the migration stories of non-European people get weighed and measured and then accepted or rejected based on whether or not they jive and gel with European immigration and settlement patterns. So Lissa and I were talking about this yesterday, right? We tend to have a favorable view of those who are escaping religious wars. Those are good immigrants. Those who are escaping poverty, not so much. European pilgrims came here because they were escaping religious wars. Is it that we have more compassion for this group because their story is more like ours? Also feels important to acknowledge that European descendants who migrated here had the resources to travel and migrate safely. Not always, not always, but a lot of the time because of the wealth that European people 
accumulated through colonialism. Europeans weren't and aren't any more naturally resourced than others. We just have a long, horrendous history of taking whatever we want from whoever we want, whenever we want, in order to get ahead. Keeping that history in mind is so important. So important. So where is God in all of this? Where is God in all of this? Sometimes God is the one calling. So he says, Moses, Moses, remove the sandals from your feet, right? Or he says, Moses, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. That's God calling, right? Sometimes God is sending. Sometimes God is sending. Jesus tells the disciples, I'm going to see Lazarus, right? And they join him and they go. Sometimes God is sending. And sometimes God is equipping. Sometimes God is equipping. In the end of John's gospel, when Jesus is telling all the disciples about the ministries that are ahead of them, he says the Holy Spirit will be your guide and will be your companion and will give you everything you need. Sometimes God is equipping. Sometimes God is accompanying. Sometimes God is accompanying, right? So we remember from Isaiah last week about when you pass through the fire and when you go through the rivers, I will be with you. I will be with you. Accompaniment. And sometimes God is grieving over the bodies of the lost and the dead. So when Jesus comes in John's gospel to Lazarus with his crew, he's, he's migrated over to see his friend. The body of Lazarus is extinguished. He's dead. And what's the first thing that Jesus does? He wept. Shortest sentence in the Bible, John 15, right? Jesus wept. Sometimes God is calling in migration, and sometimes God is sending in migration, and sometimes God is equipping, and sometimes God is accompanying, and sometimes God is grieving. But mostly, God is saving, because that's what God is about. We have a God who saves. We have a God who parts the waters and saves the Israelites. We have a God who resurrects Jesus' body. We have a God who saves. Might. Might immigrants and refugees and former exiles and diasporic communities, undocumented people, not in spite of their experience, but because of their experience, have something uniquely significant to teach us about God's saving power? What if their bodies and their stories are the sacred texts of 2014 with all of the regime change and diaspora and changing weather patterns and globalization happening on this earth right now, given that this country is only 400 plus years old and it's been changing its identity and function from its inception and no stability in any bordered territory in any epoch of history is guaranteed, wouldn't we all be smart to learn from and partner with the people brave enough to move in this life. Those who have risked safety and security in ways that most of us will never have a stinking clue about. There are unique revelations of God resting in the bodies and stories and communities of immigrants and refugees and exiled, diasporic, and undocumented people unique revelations of God. If we listen to each other, if we learn from each other, perhaps we can all discern God's revelation for today, for here and now, together. And then we can all faithfully move. Yeah. Amen. River flowing like the ivory growing, like the whirlwind blowing, 
Spirit, you move me like the ocean roaring, like the laughter soaring, like the chalice pouring. Spirit, you move me. If you know it, sing along. will be Will be changed. 